During the Second World War, over three and a half thousand young Japanese men died by deliberately crushing their planes into Allied forces. But what was the impact of these suicide missions, and what drove these young men to give their lives in the service of the Empire of Japan? Today on the History Chronicles, we will be looking at the motivations and context surrounding the kamikaze pilots of World War II. The term kamikaze is a word whose origins lie in Japanese poetry. It combines the word kami for god or spirit and kaze for wind, translating it into English as divine wind, a name that at its inception was used to refer to deadly typhoons that wrought havoc on the Japanese mainland in the 13th century. In August 1944, it was announced by the official news agency of the Japanese Empire that one flight instructor, Takeo Tagata, was training up pilots in Taiwan for suicide missions in the Pacific Theater. These attacks would consist of groups of pilots who voluntarily put themselves forward to crash their planes into high-stakes targets in the Allied Navy, such as aircraft carriers. Although the evidence is unclear as to when the first such attack took place, one source points to the first kamikaze mission dating to the 13th of September 1944. Two large bombs were attached to two fighters, with their pilots, a first lieutenant and sergeant, taking off to plan to crash into aircraft carriers. Although there is no record of a kamikaze attack hitting an allied ship that day, the pilots never returned home. On a more official level, Rear Admiral Masafumi Arima is also credited with developing the kamikaze tactic. On the 15th of October 1944, Arima personally led an attack on the aircraft carrier USS Franklin, flying his twin-engine Mitsubishi bomber onto the ship, killing himself and destroying his plane in the process. Japanese propagandists seized on this example, promoting Arima posthumously to Vice Admiral and celebrating him as the first of the official kamikaze attacks of the war. There are more examples of one-off suicide attacks early in the Japanese entry into the Second World War, but the suicide tactic does not seem to have manifested itself on a larger scale until mid-October 1944. On the 17th of October of that year, American and Filipino forces mounted an amphibious assault on the Japanese-controlled island of Leyte. The island had been seized by Japan from the Philippines as part of their expansion in the Pacific. For the Japanese, defending it against the might of the Allied Navy looked to be an impossible task. Japan had far fewer aircraft carriers than the Allies, following a series of bloody naval engagements around the Philippines. It also had only 300 aircraft, versus the 1,500 or so controlled by the Allies. Desperate times called for desperate measures, and this is where the kamikaze came in. Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi decided that a suicide offensive force would be needed. The word kamikaze at this point in time was only used in the Japanese press, in military terms, this force would be called the Special Attack Unit, or, pardon my Japanese, the Tokubetsu Kogegite. Onishi told his officers that the only way to hold the Philippines would be to strap a 250 kilogram bomb onto a Japanese bomber, and then have it crash into a US aircraft carrier, disabling it for a week. The force itself was put together by Commander Aseichi Tamai. The commander asked 23 of his young student pilots to volunteer for the force, sacrificing their lives in the service of the Japanese Empire. All of the pilots agreed to join the unit. Four subunits of Kamikaze were formed, Unit Shikishima, Unit Yamato, Unit Asahi and Unit Yamazakura. All of those names were taken from a patriotic Japanese poem about death. If someone asks about the true spirit of Japan, Yamato and Shikishima, it is the flowers of the mountain cherry blossom, the Yamazakura, that are fragrant in the rising sun, the Asahi. The first suicide attacks of this new kamikaze unit took place on the 21st of October 1944. A Japanese plane dove into a heavy cruiser of the Australian Navy, wounding 64 sailors and killing 30, including the captain. On the 25th of October, five Japanese planes were escorted to their targets over the Leyte Gulf. One aimed for the bridge of the USS Kitkin Bay, but instead struck the deck and was flung into the sea. Another two were destroyed by anti-aircraft fire from the USS Fanshawe Bay. The final two, the commanding lieutenant among them, plummeted into the carrier USS St. Lowe. The planes struck home. Their bombs caused a fire that exploded the ship's magazine and sunk her in 30 minutes. Of the 889 sailors aboard, 113 were killed, 
while another 30 or so died of their wounds later. In the Battle of the Leyte Gulf, a total of seven Allied aircraft carriers were damaged, along with 40 smaller escort ships. Five were sunk by kamikazes, with a further 23 heavily damaged by kamikaze attacks. For the Japanese, 55 kamikaze pilots lost their lives after the vicious two days of fighting that took place over Filipino seas that October. Kamikaze attacks continued to rage as the war drew on and the Japanese military grew ever desperate in an attempt to hold on to the empire that they had gained in the Pacific. Allied naval ships in turn gained experience and more effective weaponry for dealing with kamikaze attacks. By 1945, the US Navy was using anti-aircraft shells that were equipped with proximity fuses. This was better to destroy incoming aircraft travelling at exceptionally high speeds. However, the wooden flight decks of US carriers also made them more vulnerable to kamikaze attack. The peak period of the kamikaze came at the Battle of Okinawa from April to June of 1945. Here, suicide attacks managed to sink 30 US warships, but such gains came at large cost to the Japanese. The large waves of the kamikaze operation, called Operation Kikusui, or floating chrysanthemums in English, cost the Japanese Air Force almost 1,500 aircraft. What's more, the improved armour of some Allied vessels meant that a recovery was possible even after a direct hit from a kamikaze plane. On the 4th of May, for example, the British carrier HMS Formidable was struck from a great height by a kamikaze aircraft. A long steel splinter ruptured through the hangar deck and into the main boiler room. A large fire ensued, killing eight and wounding 47. However, even after such devastating impact, the fire was brought under control and the rupture in the decking repaired. By 5pm in the afternoon, British aircraft were once again able to land on the deck. Kamikazes operated against land targets too. Of the few examples that are known regarding kamikaze attempts against the Red Army, on the 10th of August 1945, a group of three kamikaze planes dove onto a Soviet tank column in Korea. Two of the aircraft were shot down, but the third crashed, destroying only one tank. A further 14 Japanese planes launched an attack on the Russians in Korea on the 12th of August 1945. Again, most were shot down, and damage from the attack was negligible, having little effect on the Red Army in the course of the Soviet-Japanese War. On the 6th and 9th of August 1945, Japan was rocked by two devastating attacks on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The atomic bomb that was dropped on both of these cities ushered in a new type of warfare in which Japanese high command realised they could not compete. The Japanese surrender was announced by the Emperor Hirohito on the 15th of August 1945. What is striking, however, is that at the time of this announcement, the Japanese had ready over 9,000 aircraft on the Japanese mainland. Of these, more than half had been specially fitted out for kamikaze attack. The war had ended, but what was clear was that the kamikaze spirit was going to last until the very end. Without the atomic bomb, perhaps it may have lasted even longer. The motivations behind the kamikaze pilots of the Second World War are difficult to trace. On an individual level, many of these men were displaying what they believed was their patriotic duty. This was, after all, what Rear Admiral Onishi had appealed to in his initial address to the 1st Kamikaze Unit back in October 1944. Stories of kamikaze pilots were widely celebrated in Japanese state propaganda. One pilot, Kiyu Ishikawa, for example, was enshrined at Izukuni, the Shinto shrine that celebrates those who had given their lives in the service of Japan. Ishikawa had saved a Japanese ship by crashing his plane into a torpedo launched by an American submarine. In October 1944, the Nippon Times published a speech of Lieutenant Sekeo Nishina that praised this kamikaze pilot. Every Japanese is capable of becoming a member of the Special Attack Force, said the lieutenant. Kamikaze pilots would share ceremonial cups of sake in a ritual that took on an almost religious significance. Upon boarding their plane for the last time, they would take with them a pistol to end their lives if captured, and many might wear the seninbari, the belt of a thousand stitches given to them by their mothers. Officers might take their swords with them, along with prayers from their families. All of this embodied a coupling of the Shinto spirituality and Japanese militarism that had become an integral part of Japanese culture in the early 20th century. For others, it was more a case of following orders or succumbing to peer pressure. Lieutenant Seki, who died on his attack on the USS St. Lowe, 
had said that he was not going on this mission for the Emperor or for the Empire, but because he was ordered to. Although joining the Special Attack Force was voluntary in principle, accounts of kamikaze pilots that survived the war suggest that there was a significant amount of peer pressure and social stigma attached to those who failed to sign up, or, even worse, if they failed their mission. Those pilots whose planes suffered a mechanical fault or were intercepted en route to their deaths, therefore landing to survive the mission, suffered social isolation for many years following the war. Some kamikaze were not even Japanese. At least 11 pilots who died in the Battle of Okinawa were Korean conscripts who had been forced to take Japanese names under the colonial legislation that had been passed in Korea before the war. The kamikaze pilots of World War II were also some of the heaviest users of methamphetamine in the war. Before takeoff, they were supplied with special pet pills called Tokujo, which, emblazoned with the Emperor's crest and consisting of a blend of meth and green tea powder, would increase their stamina and courage far more than a sip of rice wine. However, the motivation of the kamikaze also reflects a pride and fatalism that had been deeply rooted in Japanese culture for much longer than those two bloody years of 1944 and 45. The practice of seppuku, a ritualistic form of suicide by the process of disembowelment had been practiced by the samurai from as early as 1180 AD. The aim of this gruesome self-inflicted end in summary was to avoid the shame of falling into the hands of the enemy. Samurai could be ordered by their feudal lords to carry out seppuku too. This centuries old feudal system had formally died out in 1868, but such dedicated and spiritualized militarism displayed by the samurai had been revived in the Japan of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Japanese military in the early 20th century found new power in a national sentiment that had reacted badly to increased influence from the West and cuts to military spending. With the advent of the Great Depression in the 1930s, it seemed to many Japanese that only the military were able to secure Japan's prestige and standing in the international community. Allied forces that fought Japanese troops on the ground in Burma, in Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima or Okinawa for example, encountered soldiers with an extreme reluctance to surrender. To give an example, at Iwo Jima, 21,000 Japanese were killed out of a total force of 22,000. At Okinawa, the US suffered 50,000 casualties as they fought against a force of 110,000 Japanese. Of these 110,000, only 10,000 were captured or wounded. It was this last bloody battle that had a major influence on the US decision to drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, rather than launch a full-scale invasion of Japan, which would likely claim even more casualties. Within two or three months I will die, wrote one kamikaze pilot Hayashu Ichizo in his diary, shortly before taking off on a suicide mission that would end his life at Okinawa in April 1945. If my death is a glorious battlefield death, then I will welcome my fighting. Our ancestors' wish was to die beside the Emperor. Loyal individuals wish to do so. The kamikaze pilots of World War II, therefore, were young men who had grown up in a culture where patriotic sacrifice was an honour-bound duty. They, like thousands of other Japanese pilots and soldiers, would fight to the last, whether that be for the Emperor, for their homeland, or just for their family's honour. Thank you very much for watching this episode of the History Chronicles. I do hope that you've enjoyed it. Please do like and subscribe, support us on Patreon if you can, and I look forward to seeing you next time for some more history.